If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the Old Testament, to the book of 2 Kings. We're going to look a little bit in chapter 22 and a little bit in chapter 23. On Wednesday nights, I have been uh, teaching through the Kings and the Chronicles. Uh, you know, in the book of Kings, it is First and 2 Kings. It's a view of what God was doing through man's point of view. In the book of First and 2 Chronicles, it's some of the same stories, but it's the view from God's point of view. So if you want to see man's point of view, how they saw the situations, you see, you see First and 2 Kings. If you want to look at how God looks at it, it's First and 2 Chronicles. Now, the Old Testament, some people overlook it, and they say, Preacher, why aren't you preaching from the Gospel of John or something like that? Well, I will as well. But it's important to see what the Old Testament says, especially in the Kings and the Chronicles, because it shows the relationship of God with man. It shows, you now, by the way, God never changes. Amen? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it shows his nature. It shows who he is, no matter the situation and the circumstance, no matter the generation, no matter what the people think or what the people want. God's the same. So it shows how people relate to God and how God relates to his people. When they do good, what does God think about it? When they do bad, what does God think about it? Now, as we've been going through this, I ran across a verse that I, I'll just be honest with you, it just blew me out of the water. I, I've read it before, but it's never impacted my life as much as it has in the last three or four months. When King David died, Solomon took over. When King Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took over. And there was a split in the kingdom. And Rehoboam did not do well. He was young. He was inexperienced. He did not do well. In many ways, he followed Solomon. Solomon didn't finish well. Solomon made a mess out of some stuff. But at the end of Rehoboam's life, he humbled himself. And then in, in um, 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 14, there is this verse about Rehoboam. And it says this, And he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. And that's just as relevant to our lives. We will do evil if we do not prepare our heart to seek the Lord. I've preached this here. Matter of fact, I've, I've reiterated it. I've, I, I preached it in Sunday school class I teach. I've preached it in the, the two small groups that I lead. I, this verse is so prevalent. If we do not prepare our heart to seek after God, we're going to go in a different direction. And it's called evil. And you can be deceived. But if you seek God daily, now every time I've preach this, every time I've taught this, every time I've led this, I, I ask the question, what are the things that we need to be doing every day to prepare our hearts so we can seek God, so that we'll do the right thing? And people will all, in every group, the first two things that they say, matter of fact, let me, let me give y'all a test. What are the two things that right come to your mind that we need to do every day to prepare our heart to seek God? Prayer and the Word of God. Prayer and the Bible. But we're living in a society, by the way, and we're affected by how our society is going, that does not highlight the Word of God. When I was a kid growing up, preachers always preached on the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. No matter the circumstances, this is the Word. It is the truth. It, and, and we always, they would say, and I've, I've repeated this so many times, it, sin will keep you from this book, but this book will keep you from sin. Amen? And, and in the 80s, I was a young preacher. I had accepted the call to preach. And by the way, it, when I do something, I'm going to go all out. And I began to throw myself into the Word of God. I, I knew the Word of God. But the Word of God had not controlled me. Any of y'all 
get saved early and stray a little bit, follow your own path. Some of y'all still following your own path, right? But this is the path we're supposed to follow. And we went through something in the Southern Baptist Convention. We called it the battle for the Bible. There was this group that wanted to say, well, there's errors in the Bible. You, you, you can't depend on the Bible. Part of it is it inspired. Part of it is not inspired. Listen, from Genesis to the maps, it's inspired. Amen? And all of it's good. Now, you, you may not understand all of it, but that doesn't change it. I've been preaching for 30 some years, and, and I'm still learning it. I go after it because I'm thirsty and hungry. I, I go look at the Word of God every day, and I'm still finding nuggets of gold that I've never seen before, or it is not profoundly found it or there. The priority of God's Word in our lives. I've never seen Jesus, but I know Him. You know how I know him? Because of God's Word. The Gospel of John says this. John 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. At first, the darkness couldn't take it, but the darkness in me got unveiled by the light of Christ. And the Word became flesh, verse 14 says. And it dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How would we know grace if we didn't have the Bible telling us about Jesus? How would we know what truth is if it were not giving us the pattern for truth? The world has their own definition of truth. I just don't agree with it. They say that they have everything figured out. No, they really don't. As a matter of fact, the Word of God is ethically superior to everything else the world has to see. We have something called the Judeo-Christian ethic that is patterned after the Word of God. The Jews find the, the truth in the, in the commandments of the Old Testament the Christians find the commandment as it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It is what the laws of our country are based on. The greatest ethical sermon, the greatest theological treaty, uh, tre treaty that's ever been shared is, thesis that's ever been shared, is the Sermon on the Mount. It can be read in minutes. It'll take a lifetime to understand it. It's inexhaustible. That truth just continues to, to radiate the light of Christ. How would I know love if I didn't know Jesus? The world thinks that they know love, but mostly what they know is phileo. I'll love you as long as you're attractive to me. I'll love you as long as you, you make my life better. I'll love you as long as I like it. But if you disagree with me, if I have a fight with you, if I no longer find favor in you, I will discard you. I will wad you up and throw it away. That's the world's definition of love, but that's not God's. Jesus met a leper. The world threw rocks at him. He didn't run from him, he ran to him. The world said, don't touch me, you're unclean. Jesus says, I'll make you clean. That's the kind of love I want to talk about. The religious people set a trap and caught a woman in the very place of adultery. They didn't care about her. They brought her to Jesus there in the big crowd of people and said, the law says stoner, what do you say? 
That's what religion will tell you with its list of do's and don'ts. Jesus said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. How would I know love, real love, if I did not have the map that took me to the destination of love and contentment and peace and joy? What would we do? How would we know forgiveness? How would we know forgiveness 70 times 7 if it were not for the Word of God? How would we know to treat everybody the same? To not belittle or overlook if it were not for the Word of God. I could go on all day. The Word speaks of God guiding, God speaking, God teaching, God wooing us. People need to hear the Word of God. We need to seek and find. We need to chase after but yet be caught. We need to open up our lives so that we can be filled. Would you just join me as I pray real quickly that we can have a fresh look at the Word of God today? Let's pray. Father, we take you for granted so often. You've given us the perfect Word. And I pray, Lord, that we would love you, see you, honor you. But Lord, we would empty ourselves of ourselves. We would humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. And Lord, we would take the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and let you do the work that you want to do in our lives. Father, in my 61 years, I've never seen a day like we need to trust you and hear from you in your Word and follow your Word. Chase after you through your word like today. Speak, Jesus, speak. In your name I pray, amen. In 2 Kings chapter 22, there is a king by the name of Josiah. His father was killed and he became king at eight years old. He began to seek after the things of God when he was 16. He began to... Uh, uh, Look at how, as a king, he should relate to God. So he started to get the trash out of the temple when he was 20 years old. At 26 years old, one man came to him and said, I found something in the temple. Look what the Word of God says in, in uh, 2 Kings, in chapter uh, number 22, in verse number 8. Then Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the scribe, the scribe's job was to, to, to honor the Word of God, to keep the Word of God, to copy the Word of God. And this is what he said, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. I found it. It was lost. Hilkiah gave the book of Shaphan, the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan, the scribe, went to the king 26-year-old Josiah. By the way, verse 2 said he was right and did he was seeking after God. He brought the king word saying, your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered into the hands of those who do the work and oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now listen to this now. Look at Listen to verse 11. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. He wasn't hearing a story. He was hearing the voice of God. You ever have, want to have a conversation with God? He's given it to us. And when we hear God speak, Sinners that we are, we should quake. We should repent. We should fall down in worship. When, when Josiah, the 26-year-old, his dad was killed by, by people who, who did not love and respect the, the law of God. And now... He doesn't know what to do, and he's seeking after God. And at this particular moment, when he read the Word of God, he said, Oh, God, help me. 
help our nation. So what did he do? Look to chapter 3, 23. Excuse me. And as he gets to chapter 3, listen to verse 1. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. Come on now, let's get together. That's what he's saying. There's something, you, this is important. I don't care if you're sick. You come on. I don't care if you're busy. You come on. The king is saying, there's something you need to hear. The king went up to the house of the Lord, the temple, with all the men of Judah with him and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, all the people, both small and great. What did he do? The king read in the hearing of all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of Lord, you know what he did? He said, y'all need to hear this. And he read it to them. Those words that made him tear his clothes apart. The power of the Word of God. Where did this come from? Why did the king do this? Well, the word that they had just read, the, the book of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, oh yeah, Leviticus too. How many of y'all started reading the Bible and you read Genesis and Exodus and said, this is good stuff? You got to Leviticus and you quit. <laughs> he read the word of the book of the law. And in the last book, in chapter 31, I want you to hear what it says. Moses commanded them saying at the end of Every seven years at the appointed time in the year of release at the Feast of Tabernacle, when all Israel comes be, uh, to appear before the Lord your God in the place which He chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women, the little ones, the little ones, the ones you think won't listen. The ones you think fidget around that'll, that'll uh, make a noise. I like noise in the church. I like to hear a baby cry. I like to hear little children fidget. I know the parents don't, but the preacher does. When I was a kid, I'd fidget like every other kid. My dad was a preacher. He'd give me the look. <laughs> or your parents would pinch. How many of y'all had parents that pinched? God says, leave them alone. And the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law and that their children. We don't want to just have children. We want to have spiritual grandchildren. I said it last week. I want it one baby at a time. I don't care what age they are. Amen? Amen. I don't care if they're little bitty infants. I don't care if they're 50-year-olds that get saved. Amen? Let them hear that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. So you know what Josiah said? Let's do it too. When I get up here to preach, y'all listen to me now. If my preaching is not based on the Word of God, tell me to sit down and shut up. I don't want to waste your time. When you came today, what did you come here to do? To be seen? To see some friends? To sing a few songs? Or did you come to have a head-on collision with the Almighty God? Did you come ready for a God experience? Did you come ready for your heart to be strangely warmed? Did you come ready for the sword of the Spirit to cut you like a knife? Sometimes people will say, Preacher, you stepped on my toes. My dad used to say, I was aiming at your heart. Are you ready to prepare your heart to seek God? Has there ever been a day when people need to hear the truth? So let me give you a little truth real quickly. The Word of God says in Isaiah 55, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it shall 
accomplish what I please. It shall prosper in the things for which I send it. And God's people said, Luke 4, verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Luke 11, verse 28 says, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Acts 12, verse 24, And the word, the word of God, grew and multiplied. What do we need in the church? We need to stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and let the Word of God, Word of God grow within us. We need to let it multiply in our community. Romans 10, 17. So faith, by the way, Hebrews eleven six. the only way you're going to please God is by faith. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In Ephesians 6, verse 17, that is where the sword of the Spirit is called the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2, 9 says, but the Word of God is not chained. You can't confine it. Hebrews 4, 12 says, the Word of God is living. It is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts. 1 Peter 1.23 says, The Word of God lives and abides forever. So what happened when Josiah read the Word of God to the people? Look what it says in chapter 23. It says in verse 3, Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord, to follow the Lord, to keep His commandments, His testimonies, to keep His statutes with all of His heart, with all of His soul, to perform. Sounds like He's going to have to have some actions based on the Word of God. To perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book, and what did the people do? And all the people took a stand for the covenant. Is your pastor? Let me state, I stand on the Word of God. The words of the Word of God. I will not add to it. I will not take away from it. Very popular pastor who preaches a very big, at a very big church is very close to my age. When I was a young preacher back in the 80s, I talked with him. He's gone on to be a very respected man. His dad was a preacher too. But if you look at the internet and you Google his name, it's going to take you a crisis that happens in his church because they have taken a different stand on the Word of God. Romans 1 says homosexuality, homosexuality is wrong. And the, God gives grace, and God will forgive of any sin. It doesn't matter. God loves you with an everlasting love. But with that comes repentance. When you see yourself, you don't ask God to come join you. You leave who you are, and you go to join God. But this popular preacher is saying, oh, just come as you are, just take Jesus just accept Jesus. You can, you can have your perverted lifestyle. The greatest thing that we can do is not change the Word, just preach the Word. Let the Holy Spirit do what He does. I can't save anyone. By the way, I can't change anyone. But I'm always marvel when God does. He took a stand. New Holland, I promise you, I will take a stand on the Word of God. My question is, will you stand with me? Are we going to prepare our heart to seek God? Well, He made a commitment, a covenant, 
the people stood with him, then what was going to happen? They had to get rid of some junk in their lives. Look in verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, the priests of the second order, the doorkeepers, to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal. Y'all ever heard of the God of Baal? The God of nature? The God of rain? For Asherah? For all the hosts of heaven? Yeah, there were people who were making uh, idols to the, the stars, to false angels, fallen demons. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the field of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. And he goes on to say he got rid of all of them. How many of y'all have pet sins? Raise your hand. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Pet sins. I'm a dog person. We have a dog by the name of Jeb. He'll eat the tires right off your car. <laughs> he is the chewingest thing I've ever seen. My carport looks like a hurricane hit it. Lynn gave him a, a, a wooden clothes hanger. He chewed it up. But he's my dog. We're dog people, and we love him. Amen? He's my pet. Good, bad. How many of y'all have some things in your life that shouldn't be there and you know about it and you've been dealing with it forever, but you keep it? Hebrews 12, Old King James. Y'all like Old King James? The sin that does so easily beset you. New King James, the, the sin that will so easily trip you up. How many of you have been fighting the same sin for 30 years? 40 years? Oh, y'all who look so righteous out there. I know y'all. You're squirming right now. There's some things in your life that if, if, if you got up here and, and I said, I'm going to give you a microphone, confess your sins, you would blush, you would quake, you would be so embarrassed, you would say, I'm, I, 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 I. Yet God already knows it. And God came to die for you so his blood could cleanse you and deliver you. But you're not too sure if you're ready to do that or not. I'm going to say something plain. Every idol's got to go. But start at the root. Find the root of the problem. Can I confess to you? Y'all know my biggest sin? My biggest sin is pride. Lynn, don't amen that. From head to toe, I am a proudful person. But what I found is that I, I have been dealing with the symptoms of pride. And there are many. And when there's an issue in my life, I want to know not only what it is, but I want to know why it's there and why it's so hard to get rid of. And in my life, when I trace it back, it will come back to Brian in pride. You may say, Pastor, you're so shallow. You're so right. I still care what people think. It hurts. I, I know I've got, I've got skin. It's like a rhinoceros. You can't hardly, you can shoot me with a 22 and it just bounces off of me. Yet sticks and stones may break your bones, but names won't hurt you. Oh, yes, they will. There are people that have been. Somebody said something about them in the second, third grade, and they're carrying that baggage with them all their life. What somebody else thinks about them. If we're going to get to the root of, of letting God cleanse us, y'all listen to me real quick here. Take out the trash and lay it at the feet of Jesus and let the let the Holy Spirit get that 
royal rab and dip it in the blood of Jesus and come into your life and start cleansing you. Do y'all know what I mean when you go through the house and you get rid of the spider's webs and you come back the next day and there, there's more? I know y'all's houses are clean. We got spider webs. And they're sneaky. They just come up. Kill the spider! I got a hush. Look in verse 21. Can I say to you, as I studied for this message, I saw this and I had never seen it before. Verse 21. Then the king commanded all the people saying, keep the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in the book of the covenant. How many of y'all know about the Passover? Children of Israel leaving Egypt. Amen. And the last plague was that he would kill the firstborn in the house. And they were to go in the house. They were to they, they take the lamb. They would take it on the 10th day, keep it to the 14th day. It had to be a, a, a lamb without spot or a blemish. And they would take the blood of it. They were to eat the lamb, but they would take the blood of it and go to the edges of the doors. And with the hyssop, they were dipping it in the blood and put it over there so that whoever went into the, into the house came under the blood of Jesus Christ. And when the death angel came and passed over, everywhere he saw the blood, he would pass over the house. But every house that did not have the blood applied, the firstborn was killed. And the Pharaoh said, this is enough, leave. And this became the greatest thing for the Jewish people. Every year, they would keep the Passover, unleavened bread. Jesus became our Passover. The bread, the body that was broken for us, the blood that was shed for us, right? But hear this. When the people said, we're tired of the prophets leading us. We don't want the priests leading us. We want a king. Samuel was the leading prophet at that moment. God said, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. Give them a king. Y'all ever heard of King Saul? Who replaced him? King David? Solomon? I mean, and it goes on. But from the time of Samuel to the time of Josiah, they had never followed, they had never partaken of the Passover. Hundreds of years, generation after generation, the Jewish people did not come and fall before Christ and worship Him who would provide, who would give the blood, who would cleanse them, who would keep them with His covenant. So you know what Josiah said? The Word of God says we're supposed to keep the Passover. Let's keep the Passover. Church, we need to worship. We need to worship every day. And when we don't worship, we're not preparing our heart to be obedient to God, to seek God. Pastor, you're, that sounds like a lot of work. You're telling us we got to pray. You're telling us we have to have a quiet time. I know that's good, but, but you don't understand. I'm busy. I don't have time for church. I don't have time for worship. I don't have time for accountability. I don't have time for, for corporate things. I'll just do mine at the lake with the, me and my hook. You know, Jesus caught fish. So can I. And when you don't catch, when you catch that, that log, how many of y'all have ever been fishing and caught a limb? And what came out of your mouth? The same thing that happens when you're in Walmart and they cut you off in the parking lot. What comes out of your mouth? Worship? I mean, people sometimes use Jesus Christ's name, but they... They don't use it the right way. Can I hear you? They may talk about God, but they, you may want God to damn those people over there. 
That's not the love of Christ. I am a pastor that loves the Word of God, that loves the people. I would rather preach than eat. Though I will eat. But I'm under conviction about this book. My prayer for you today is that you come under conviction about this book too. How many of you have more than one copy? How many of you have more than 10 copies? How many of you have found yourself where you didn't read it from Sunday to Sunday? See, nobody's raising their hands now. Yeah, we've got a few. How many of you look for that special Bible that you have and it's got dust on it? How many of you start the year off saying you're going to read the whole Bible and you die in Leviticus? Charles came to me last year in about August. He said, I finished the Bible. What do I do now? I said, start over. It's okay. Read it more than once. I could preach 20 different sermons, but it really comes back to one thing. How are you relating? How are you preparing to seek your God, your heart, preparing your heart to seek the Lord? I prayed before this, before I went to 2 Kings 22, 23. I prayed that, that we would be open for the Holy Spirit to, to touch us, to, to draw us, to woo us back to Himself. We got a house full today. I thank you for coming. And when you leave, I pray blessings upon you. I, I, I pray that you have great health, though that's not the most important thing. I pray that you prosper, though that's not the most important thing. I pray that you have a good week, but I pray that you define your good week by Christ and not by you getting down your agenda. I know I'm not a fire and brimstone snorting and spitting and slammering preacher, though I did about lose my voice. But I pray that in the next moments, in the next days, in the weeks to come, that you will hear the still, small voice of God calling you to Himself. That's the best place in all this world to be. If you agree with me, Let's do this. I'll make the covenant. You join the covenant with me.